If there is one piece of literature that we refer to as uh, children's literature that is positively not children's literature, it is Alice in Wonderland. I remember as a child how much that book always freaked me out. In particular, when you get to the middle of the book, there's that story of the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. The table is ornately set for high tea. The clock is permanently stuck at 6 p.m., so it is tea time. It is always tea time. There's 12 chairs pulled up to the table. There's room for 12 at tea, but there's only three participants at the party, and two of them are using the dormouse as their leaning post. And even then, the hare, the hatter, and the dormouse, uh, as they, they gather, they, they keep saying these ridiculous things, and they just keep moving from chair to chair to chair to chair around the table, pretending that it is a party. But no one else is ever going to come, and there's never going to be any other voices at the table. I read that story, I remember and I think this is not children's literature. This is something to be sectioned under the Mental Health Act. It's far too disturbing. It disrupts your sense of reality. Alice in Wonderland, a book designed to shock people into realizing what they're doing in life. A story told to transform. Maybe that is why we shy away from the Bible you open up the Bible and you expect to hear a nice little children's story, a sweet story to calm your nerves. And then you read Jesus in a parable like this today. And it's not sweet and calming at all. It's more like a stall therapy. It's designed to deeply shock you and offend you. In fact, the more you pay attention to it, the more it shocks you. So we have the parable of the party. And we all know how parties go. It starts with the guest list. And you think, who's going to be the most fun to invite? Who will bring the most charisma? Who's going to be the most entertaining at the party? Who's someone that will make us feel happy? Who will uh, make us feel impressed? Will make us feel important? Your friends who will lavish you with love. People who can give you something. Your boss, your co-workers, the rich, the famous the people that can make us feel good about ourselves, your brothers, your sisters, the people who accept us as we are and, and, and don't expect anything more from us, people who will invite us to their parties in return. I was thinking about that and mulling over this disturbing parable this morning when I heard a nationally syndicated talk show host complaining about how people complain today citing a quote from a diary written by a member of the Donner Party when they were stuck those hundred years, some years ago, up in the high mountain pass in the middle of winter. This talk show host railed on that the only complaint in that diary of the Donner Party was about the coldness of one particular day. This talk show host was saying even though they had to cannibalize one another, they did not complain. And so the talk show host railed on that we need to get used to our situation, used to viruses, that some people are going to have to die. Get used to it was the end point of the story. And my head was reeling. Get used to it? Get used to people dying? Social Darwinism is alive and kicking. But then you look around at life and you see a world where people don't seem to care much about one another. A world of fickle friends and betraying confidence. A world of advertisement and ideology and euphemism that offers us endless phoniness and manipulates and seduces us. A world that's emotionally brutal, with little generosity or forgiveness or welcoming compassion. A world of exclusion and despair. And you see so many people so nervous. When will they be bumped off the top of the heap? Some are in free fall already. And we live in this virtual world that somehow makes it difficult to feel real. And we all feel excluded except maybe a few. And it feels like our relationships are bought with a credit card. You get 
something now, but you have to pay them back later with interest. And people become angry when they realize the credit card company is not their friend and they're not their family and that's how life is. And what they deeply, deeply is, are yearning for is some sort of sense of love. And they become mad about it. And they're mad and thrown into a rage over wearing a mask, over disagreeing with somebody's politics. Not because they're mad about the mask. It is so much more. It is a deep fear and anxiety stoked by an en endless messages of resentment. When the deep, deep hunger is, deep down, people need to feel loved and valued. And instead they get business transactions. They assume they're being used. And now, when we think on that, it becomes more clear why Jesus thinks parties are so important. This is about more than a guest list. This is about where we are headed. Who is worthy and who is not? Who is in and who is out? We think the world is this business transaction, and then the world, according to Jesus, gets flipped on its head. Jesus says, when you plan a party, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the outsider, the outcast, the downcast, the hung down, brung down, hung up, cast off, cast out, weird, worn out, burn out, and put out to pasture. Instead of inviting the somebodies, put on a party for the nobodies. Put on a party where all the nobodies are invited to come. And don't just invite them lightly. Jesus says, compel them to come. Make it such a great party that they have to show up. What's going on with his saying this? I think if you hear what Jesus is really saying, reality will never be the same again. Rituals matter in our rituals. We remind ourselves of who we are and what is a party but a symbolically important ritual that answers the question to one of life's important questions. Who are the people who really count in this world? Who are the people who really count? Jesus says it's not based on birth, it's not based on income, it's not based on social status, it's not based on physical prowess. Jesus reveals that this world is a foretaste of the kingdom of heaven. The reality is none of us are fit to make the guest list. We're all imperfect, imperfect, broken, sick. We're all rejects, outcasts, and outsiders. But God is the host of the party, and only God gets to play God. And God invites us all to come to the party because we matter. In this parable, the Greek word kaleo is used 12 times, and the word means inviting. And so you're pictured in this story of God inviting, 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 inviting. 12 times it says inviting, and 12 is the perfect number. So this is a complete perfect invitation that God gives to the world, saying you are noticed, you are valued, you are wanted, you are loved, you are invited. You belong at God's party. Accept the fact that you are accepted. Love the fact that you are loved and come to the celebration. And then live into that celebration. Create a world where you make everyone feel at home. Because God is giving this party. And the question, the only question that matters is, are you going to come to the party? The way to get in and to really feel the fullness of the celebrations is to make sure that everyone knows that they are on the list. This is an image of radical inclusion, a love of strangers, love of the different, love of outsiders, the weird and the wonderful, and they are all welcome in this world along with us. And each of us makes choices in our lives about who will and will not be included in our lives at our celebration. The question is, who will we invite in the big celebration of life? This is a question with inescapable moral dimensions to it, and it is our way of, if we take it in, it's our way of becoming more human. 
Bono and U2 uh, had that classic rock song, uh, a song that was born in the time of the troubles in Northern Ireland, where you were judged based upon the name of the street where you lived. And if you were on the wrong street at the wrong time, it was a life and death issue. And so you two sang, I want to run, I want to hide, I want to tear down the walls that hold me inside. I want to reach out and touch the flame where the streets have no name. I want to feel sunlight on my face. I see the dust cloud disappear without a trace. I want to take shelter from the poison rain where the streets have no name. That's a parable of the party where Jesus pictures a world where the streets have no name. Jesus pictures a world without walls, without barriers of exclusion, and he says, don't get used to people dying. Get used to people living in the celebration with passion and joy and outrageous love. Welcome everyone to the party. And the question we have to ask ourselves, who are we including on our list to the celebration of life? We find ourselves in this time wearing masks, not so much for ourselves, do we? But really, isn't it to include the most vulnerable in our population, inviting them to keep on living and say they matter? And the party would not be the same without them. We're keeping appropriate social distance because we want the most vulnerable among us to live. And it is a life and death matter in our time. For Jesus, parties were serious business because in our rituals we remind ourselves of who we are. A party is a ritual where people bond and there is this pervasive feeling of oneness. And once the walls are broken down at that party, at that celebration, the world is never the same again after that because we see that we're part of God's good creation together. Jesus invites us into a world of welcome where the other is not a threat but a treat, not a competitor but a cohort, not optional but vital, and this whole life is a celebration. I shared a story with uh, the prayer partners this week. Um, it came from a story, that The Happy Hypocrite by Max Beerbaum, though I think it comes from an ancient story beyond before that. It's a story of this angry, hateful, mean man who had lived that way his whole life. His face was distorted by years of practice, snarling and being spiteful. Children would cry when they saw his face. It was so scary. And then from a distance, this man saw this beautiful woman, and he fell in love with her. But he would not show his face. He put on this mask because she knew that she would have nothing to do with him. And from behind the mask, he pretended. He pretended to be kind and thoughtful, loving, gracious, compassionate, he pretended to be all these virtuous things as he met her and as he spent hours with her every day and they became fast friends, but always, always he kept on the mask. And after years, he asked her to marry him, but she refused unless he would take off the mask. And finally, after... Sometime he relented and took off the mask, assuming that she would draw away in disgust, but instead a smile beamed across her face because after all those years of acting noble behind the mask, he took it off and his face had changed and now he had the face of a saint. Wouldn't it be nice if the world thought about that story as we spend time behind our masks, as if we could see it a time to practice being more than we have been, to practice being our most noble selves, 
reaching out from an appropriate social distance, reaching out with all the love, grace, kindness, and joy that we can muster, and, and creating this world that is more welcoming, more loving, more like the kingdom of heaven. In our rituals, we remind ourselves of who we are. In our parties, we reveal not just our relationships, but our reality. In our celebrations, we show our cerebellum. In our wonder times, we reveal our worldview. And what we are is hosts at this party of life. Being a host is a position of power, and we have power. The power to invite, the power to welcome, the power to include. And the question is, who are you going to invite to this celebration we call life? Who's real in your reality? For Jesus, life is a celebration, a party. And the question is, who are you going to invite to taste the goodness of the feast that God intends? Jesus gives a list of all the vulnerable ones. And if we include them, if we include them, then all of a sudden, truly, this world will become new. And we all get to walk into the celebration of the kingdom of heaven, even now. Amen. Thanks for watching our video. Make sure to subscribe to get the latest and greatest videos from the Old Stone Church. And if you feel blessed by our message, please go to the oldstonechurch.org and click donate. God bless you today and forever. The Old Stone Church. We've been loving Christ and serving city since 1820.